Python application in AWS. Um, so about me, I'm a um, software developer with uh, eight years experience as of now. I have worked with many different technologies, including cloud, uh, web, um, desktop applications, embedded applications, you name it. Um, yeah, I'm currently, I am working mostly in, in cloud and I, uh, I um, really enjoy it, uh, as you might um, expect from me, given uh, a, a, a presentation about developing Python applications in AWS. Uh, so what are we going to, uh, to talk about? So uh, we, we, will, uh, we will start with, uh, uh, with an introduction. So we will talk about what is AWS, what will you learn during this session, uh, what are the pre uh, prerequisites for following uh, this session yourself. Um, then we will move, uh, um, move on to um, what issues do we need to solve when, uh, when uh, working on web applications in the cloud and how uh, AWS can help us, uh, uh, help us with that. And then um, as a follow-up to this, we will talk about what is serverless and, and, and how, do, uh, how do we use it. Then we will design our, um, our web application and we will start doing some AWS hands-on uh, with some components that we will use to build our application. Uh, for, this, for this session, we will only have time to talk about Dynamo, uh, DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL, uh, NoSQL database, and IAM, uh, which is part of AWS that is used to, um, to manage access to uh, to its components. It's very, very important. We need to talk about it uh, before we move on to some um, to some more um, exciting stuff, let's say. And we will also see how to uh, do programmatic access to AWS because you don't always use like um, the website, right? And yeah, then I, I hope we, we will have time for a, a short Q&A session. I hope you will have some questions about this. And after this, in two weeks, we will have a, a, a part two. All right, so let's move on. What is AWS? Amazon Web Services is a cloud platform, which doesn't probably tell you much if you don't know what it is already. So this is a service provider for compute or storage and eh, and databases, archiving, block, uh, blockchain, serverless, and so on, and so on, and so on. It is also uh, like um, like um, uh, par uh, parallelly a service provider for uh, for IT, for industry, for automotive, for uh, healthcare, government, and so on, and so on. It's uh, it's it's meant to be used by enterprise, public sector, small businesses, startups, and individual uh, individual individual individuals, sorry. Um, basically this uh, AWS consists of over 200 data centers uh, spread ar uh, around the world, which means that Am Amazon um, like owns a lot of computers in those data centers and they own them so you don't have to basically do. They exist to help you solve um, IT problems. Um, what will you learn uh, during this session? You will learn how to deploy a serverless Python application in AWS. Uh, you will learn some uh, basics of some common AWS components. You will learn what is serverless, what's good and bad about it. And you will learn how AWS identity and permission man management works. It's meant to be kind of a get your feet wet kind of course. Um, so obviously there will be some stuff that you won't learn. And which is uh, you want uh, uh, really um, like learn or ga gain experience in managing or deploying production ready applications and infrastructure because we simply don't have time to talk about all the uh, all the quirks or uh, things to look out for when using AWS. And if you do something um, uh, which is a bad practice or which is um, like uh, irresponsible. Amazon will not stop you from doing it. They will just send you an invoice after uh, on the end of, uh, of the month. <laughs> um, cloud engineering is a skill that, uh, that, that requires training and experience, like all the skills basically, right? And if you would like to, uh, to, uh, to follow up on this uh, course, 
um, there are a lot of resources for you to, uh, to take on. All right, so, so uh, some prerequisites to, uh, for following this course. If you just want to listen to it, you, uh, it would be advised to have some Python basics because this is after all uh, about Python apps and no AWS experience is needed. Um, I will talk you through all the, uh, all the basics, important stuff. And if you want to do some DIY, you will need um, an AWS account. You will need Python 3 installed and a Boto uh, 3 package. And you will also need AWS CLI uh, version 2 installed on your machine. I realize that it might be too late now for, uh, for um, everyone to, uh, to uh, set up those things um, right now, but uh, I guess um, it would be uh, more comfortable for everyone if, uh, if they just followed at their own pace after um, uh, using uh, rather the recording from this presentation. So how do we deploy a Python application to AWS? It's kind of a big question, um, but, but why? Why is it a big question? Why does uh, why is AWS vast and has an overwhelming number of solutions? Why couldn't we just start a virtual machine in the cloud and deploy our our code on uh, on that? So um, how would that look? Is that we create a virtual machine on AWS using Elastic Compute Cloud uh, because that's how the com uh, component is called. Uh, we would SSH into the machine, uh, we would install Python and some WSGI um, server. Um, alternatively, we could install Py um, uh, Docker and then uh, pull our uh, Docker images. Um, yeah, installing all the, uh, all the application files. Uh, then we would configure the virtual machine to accept HTTP traffic and we're done, right? Um, not really, right? Because there are some things that we forgot about. So um, what about security? What about SSL certificate? How do we deploy it? Where do we get it from? Uh, do we host it on the same machine as we host our, our application or do we use some kind of a um, uh, reverse proxy? Um, how do we implement authentication, log, logging in, registering? Do we write it all ourselves? Uh, how do we authorize uh, HTTP requests like JWT or some other uh, kinds of uh, authorization. And follow up to this, how do we implement cores? How do we implement request uh, throttling? How do we um, implement automated access with uh, API keys? What about monitoring? How do we monitor our uh, virtual machine load or the application health? Or how do we inspect logs or, or um, resource usage? How do we um, analyze app performance or request latency? Uh, what about scalability? How, uh, where do we host our database? Where do we store the files? How do we do scaling? How do we load balance? Uh, how do we automate new, new virtual, uh, virtual machine creation? Uh, how do we handle spikes of traffic? And what about costs? Uh, how do we know how much uh, how how much does our app cost basically? How much of it is compute? How much of it is storage networking? Uh, how do we know if we if we provisioned optimal number of uh, of resources? So in our uh, in our case, uh, virtual machines because we might have over provisioned and we are paying for uh, for more than we need. And what about DevOps? Uh, where do we test and build the application? How, to, uh, how do we deploy it to the application? If we load balance, how do we deploy over the whole cluster? How do we manage separate environments, right? Um, that's a lot of stuff, basically. So uh, it's, it's not so simple as it might seem. Um, yeah, that's a lot of issues and there are probably even more. But AWS has components and tools that help you solve all, uh, all of them, basically. Um, so AWS is vast and offers a lot of solutions because IT is vast and requires a lot of solutions. And effectively using the uh, tools provided by uh, AWS or, or basically any other cloud provider help, uh, will help you build software that is manageable, cost-efficient, scalable, and fast. So how to deploy a Python application to AWS? 
um, we still can't answer this question because it depends. Is it a new or existing application? Is it, is it monolithic, tiered, or a set of microservices? Because all of those um, architectural things will uh, influence which components we will be using. What protocols is it using? Is it only HTTP or is it web sockets or is it some, uh, some, um, some pr uh, uh, proprietary um, protocol or whatever? Does, uh, does it do anything else besides HTTP? Uh, serving HTTP traffic, for example, does it do any uh, any uh, uh, any work in the background? What's the scale of the application? Is it small? Is it big? How how much does it change um, throughout the time? Is the application stateless or is it stateful? Uh, this is all very important when choosing the the uh, right solutions for the job. So let's focus on a one single. Uh, simple specific use case. Let's write a new application, which will be a JSON serving REST microservice, plus some somewhere in the future, a website for the users. Um, it's quite common, I would say, because that's how you, uh, how you develop applications right now, mostly as, uh, as REST microservices. Um, scale will be small on the beginning because we, uh, we are just creating our application, but when we um, quote unquote publish it, 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 may, it might get uh, larger. So let's make a to-do app. Uh, so an application that will help users manage their, um, their to-do points or whatever. And this looks like a perfect use case for serverless. So let's talk about it. What is serverless? This is a, uh, this is a way of building applications without worrying about its infrastructure. So in the typical approach on the left, you have your application and, uh, and CI CD pipelines built on top of, of um, actual physical machines somewhere. So you have to worry about uh, uh, the VMs or the nodes. You have to worry about the uh, uh, operating system and drivers. You, uh, you need to worry about the updates, right? And then uh, on top of it, you need to worry about your application itself. With serverless, you, uh, you build your application and your CI CD pipelines on top of serverless resources without worrying about um, how are they um, managed, what is the infrastructure that, uh, uh, that supports them. So why serverless? Uh, because with that approach, you don't need to manage servers and software to execute code, to perform CI CD pipelines, to store files, to host databases, to deploy containers, to host messages, queues, and, uh, and whatever, and many, many, many other different stuff. Um, serverless philosophy is, is um, um, tells you that you can focus on business logic and not on hosting it. Um, but why? Um, it, it, it often turns out that this kind of approach lets you be very cost efficient. It's, it lets you be extremely scalable. Um, obviously, it will have very low operational overhead because you don't need to worry about the uh, infrastructure. And it would often work out of the box with the rest of the cloud ecosystem. And so, the, since this is the most AWS thing I could think of, and this is about um, developing a Python app in, in AWS, I thought um, that is a great thing to talk about. Um, I, I did, I, um, additionally, I will make an educated guess that many of you have set up a hosted machine somewhere and, uh, and deployed code uh, directly to it, but not, not so many of you um, have, to, uh, have worked with a serverless approach. So, so let's try it out. Let's build a Python application with it. All right, so let's talk about our application. It will be a to-do app, so it will store a list of to-do items for, uh, for, uh, for users. The user will be able to add new items, mark them as done, remove and, up uh, and update them. The application will be serverless. It will be a REST service uh, serving JSON payloads. The architecture um, has uh, th uh, three tiers, let's say. So we have the REST API. We have the API implementation in Python, and we and we have a a persistence layer uh, uh, or database to store the to do items. 
uh, the architecture would look something like this. To host the API, we will use um, API Gateway component of AWS. To execute code in the cloud, we, uh, we will use Lambda. And to store database entries, we will use DynamoDB. So basically, uh, API Gateway will, um, will um, handle our um, REST or HTTP traffic, so, uh, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, Lambda will contain um, functions that will contain code um, implementing those uh, HTTP um, uh, handlers. And they will talk to DynamoDB uh, to, uh, to a table inside to, uh, to write the to do items in there and, uh, and read from, uh, from it. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, Mateusz, we have uh, one question in our chat from Oleg. Oh, all right. Uh, I can read or if it's possible for you to read. Uh, one of the questions that appears, why to use Python instead, instead of TypeScript? Um, um, that is an interesting question. I mean, uh, no one stops you really from, uh, from using TypeScript. Um, Actually, this is a language that I've seen very often use, uh, used in, in cloud environments. Um, so the only reason is, is why not, basically. Um, it, it all uh, boils down to, uh, to personal preferences. Um, basically, why this presentation is about Python is that um, I've seen that there are a lot of requests. Um, yeah, basically what uh, Dimitro uh, wrote. Uh, there were a lot of requests um, to make a, a session about using Python in AWS. So hence this presentation. Um, Victor, we will talk about, uh, about costs of using Lambda in part two, because um, we won't have time right now to uh, to tackle this specific component. Just, just a question, uh, mm -hmm. Mateusz, uh, because uh, yeah, just answering the question about TypeScript versus Python. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be using Fast API uh, to implement this, or uh... Uh, no? Actually, not okay. this time. Okay. Uh, we will be using um, AWS's component for hosting APIs, which is API Gateway. Okay, because yeah, that could be one of the answers because I, I, I don't know if there's a good alternative in JavaScript for, for this kind of uh, API building block as fast mm -hmm. as API in Python. But mm -hmm. yeah, of course there's a preference of language, but yeah, I, I, I think there, there are some advantages of using Python. <clears throat> yeah, all sorry. right, yeah. All right, so let's move on. Uh, we will not uh, now get into um, um, doing some hands-on on the on all of those specific components, and we will start from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, farthest backend, so DynamoDB, because this will allow us in the future, when we learn it, it will allow us to actually do something interesting with our Python code later, right? Because this is something that we can actually interact with in the cloud right now, or will be when we create the tables. All right, so DynamoDB. It is a fully managed serverless key value no SQL database. It's designed to be scalable, fast, reliable, and available. Um, when you use DynamoDB, you don't need to worry about storage, about servers, shards, etc. You just create tables and you throw data at them and it just works. It offers very, um, very nice features on top of it. So, and so it uh, offers encryption at uh, at, and at transit. It offers continuous backups, uh, automated um, data replication across um, uh, regions globally. It offers in-memory caching for, uh, for performance improvements. It has an SQL compatible query language uh, that you can use if you prefer. Uh, it has data expert tools for uh, for uh, for analysis your uh, your usage and and so on. All right, so um, let's try to use it. <laughs> I will now 
uh, move on to, I will, uh, sorry, how to change my, I need to do, do this differently. All right, do you see my screen? Yes. All right, so let's go to AWS console. And we will log in ourselves to my AWS account. All right, so we're inside AWS console. So um, how to get to DynamoDB from here is um, you can type in the top bar DynamoDB. We will be um, taken to the DynamoDB dashboard. Uh, which will um, list some stuff that is not interesting for us right now. If we go to tables, we will see that there are no tables right now. So we can create one. So we create a uh, 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 um, click create table button and we fill in some information. A uh, table is something that will uh, hold our, um, our data items in DynamoDB. This is something uh, similar to what you have in SQL uh, databases, but without um, all the SQL overhead. Um, so table name, to do's, partition key. We will use ID for this, which will be a number. Um, we don't need to add sort key for now. We, uh, we won't be needing this uh, throughout this uh, course. And we will use uh, the default settings because we just want to to try out some um, some functionalities, we we click create table again, and we see that AWS is provisioning our uh, table for us. So yeah, it should be already active by now. Go to to do's, and if we click here, we see that there are no items right now, but we can. Um, we can add them easily clicking create item. So um, as we see that the only um, key that we need to add to each item is, is, is the ID that we have uh, configured as the partition key. And all the other fields are completely optional. We can add, oh, I forgot to add some. Keys. We can add as many uh, as many other keys as uh, as we uh, want. Whether those are strings, let's put in values here, value here, um, and we will add a value here, which will be um, course. And then we will add another um, key for storing information about um, this item being complete or not. It's not complete, so. Let's create another another uh, item for us. All milk. True. All right. So as you can see, that's all. Um, that's uh, all the basic behavior uh, that we will need from uh, uh, from the table. Um, uh, DynamoDB, as as many of the other um, components of AWS, has um, has like um, very simple interface on the um, on the surface, but you can go um, uh, really deep with configuration optimizations for your specific use case. So. Um, so we can see that uh, uh, the basic CRUD interface is here, and and we have um, a lot, a lot more um, if we uh, if we need any of the uh, any of that. But we are not uh, re required to uh, use any of the extra uh, extra stuff. All right, so that would be it for for some basic hands-on. Let's go back to the presentation for now. Um, all right, so some important things about the DynamoDB. Uh, as I said, it has no servers to provision. It's a NoSQL, uh, NoSQL database. So uh, as such, it doesn't use SQL, but it has some structure to it, right? So it has tables, 
in which you have items, in which you have uh, keys. Um, you don't require uh, to provide any schema for, uh, for the table. You just provide any data that you, uh, that you um, have or need for now. Um, only the, uh, uh, the, prom uh, the primary or the ID, in our case key, needs to be present in each of the items. Um, what other stuff? Uh, you are able to provision um, read and write performance. Uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, to support load of your application, or you can use the the um, default uh, auto scaling settings that the AWS will detect for you. Um, uh, you are able to create uh, indexes uh, from your uh, for your tables. You are able to specify um, additional key, which is a sort key. Uh, for uh, for um, additional flexibility and in, in, in querying and uh, and sorting the data, um, you can create something that looks like a, a uh, like a view over uh, a different set of keys uh, for even more flexibility in in, in querying and and sorting the data. Um, you um, you also uh, have the possibility to uh, to choose between uh, event, eventual consistency and uh, and strong consistency when writing to uh, to the database. So eventual consistency means that um, when you write an item, it will be visible in the database at some point later, and uh, and strong consistency means that um, when you uh, write the item, it is guaranteed to be um, readily um, uh, visible in uh, in the table by the other, uh, by the other clients. Uh, do you have any questions? I can see that there are some uh, questions about Lambda. All right, so this is some discussion about Lambda. Do you have any questions about um, DynamoDB for now? All right, if not, so let's move on. Um, what we will do now is that we will try to use um, DynamoDB or more generally AWS uh, programmatically. We will try to write a Python application that will um, access our table that we have just created. So how can we access DynamoDB programmatically? We can um, call AWS HTTP APIs or we can use an SDK. Um, SDK is a library that basically wraps around the uh, APIs, but yeah, it's much more convenient um, in, in many cases. Um, and Python does have one and it's very popular. It's named Bottle 3. So um, how do we configure our, uh, our environment to, uh, to allow programmatic access? Because applications need uh, authentication too, right? But they won't be using uh, um, 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 in AWS, they won't be using uh, login plus password for it. They will be using access keys, which are uh, credential pairs uh, consisting of key ID and a key secret. So where do we take those access keys from? We take it from uh, AWS console where we uh, go uh, go now back again. Uh, okay. Right, so we're in the console. Uh, on the top bar, you can see your account uh, ID. Uh, you click on it and you go to security credentials. And you have uh, here a section that is uh, named access keys. And uh, basically to create a new access key that will be usable for, uh, uh, by your applications, you need to click um, this button, create new access key. But wait, what is this message here? Root user access keys provide unrestricted access to your entire, entire AWS account. If you need long-term access keys, we recommend creating a new IAM user with limited permissions and generating access keys for that user instead. All right, so um, I don't expect you to understand fully what is written here. And it's very important that you do. So uh, before we go any further with 
uh, with accessing our um, um, resources in our account. Um, let's talk about, uh, about what uh, does this all mean. So let's talk IAM. Um, basically, when you create a AWS account and you first log in using your uh, root account uh, credentials, you are logged in as a root user. Root user is a user that has unrestricted access to the whole AWS account. Um, you, a root user can create new resources, can, uh, can modify and access all, uh, all of the existing resources. And uh, not only that, they uh, have access to, uh, to personal information of the owner, uh, they have access to the billing information of, of the owner of the account and so on. Um, so this is very unsafe to, uh, to not only use uh, root uh, user for day-to-day uh, -day tasks, it's also very unsafe to, um, to use access keys uh, authenticating uh, the root user. Because what happens if, if someone uh, steals your, um, your uh, root credentials? They would be able to steal uh, customer's data uh, from your application, Content of the uh, of uh, because the content of uh, of the of the um, personally identify uh, and identifiable information and securing it is is my responsibility as a um, owner, right? So um, and the users are entrusting me with their data, with safety of their of their content. So uh, this is something that um, I wouldn't. Uh, want to happen to my applications, right? And also, uh, root user is able to create as many resources in AWS as as they want, basically, right? So, uh, if someone steals uh, those credentials, they will be able to create rogue resources, botnets, con uh, coin miners, etc. And and I'm paying for all of it, <laughs> not them, but me. So yeah. So don't use root user to build applications in AWS. This is very, very important. Uh, so how does IAM work? Uh, what is it? So this big box is your AWS account, right? On the left side, you have um, identities. So you have the root user, you have um, normal or IAM users, uh, so they are called. You have user groups and you have roles. All of those are identities that uh, that um, represent either a person or a uh, or a machine resource uh, in the account. In the middle, you have policies, which govern uh, which identity from the left uh, can access which resources on the right, basically. And the resources on the right are, for example, uh, virtual machines or Lambda functions or DynamoDB tables, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, so this is listing of all the terms. So yeah, so identity can be either a user, user group, or a role. And, and policy is a set of permissions defining who has those permissions, which identity, um, what actions uh, they can perform, and on uh, which resources. So uh, for now, what are the do's and don'ts for, uh, for IAM? Don't use root user for everyday tasks because it has unbounded permissions to everything and also permissions that you don't need uh, to work with the resources. What you should do instead is to create an IAM user with administrative access. Um, what's the, uh, but what's the difference? Um, what's the difference you might ask? Uh, the different uh, the, the difference is, is that um, if administrator user goes rogue, you, uh, root user is still safe and the account itself is still safe, right? And cutting off rogue uh, access for a IAM user, um, no matter uh, uh, their permissions is very easy, but cutting off rogue access to, uh, to root account is not. So um, how do, do we add IAM users? We will do this right now. Okay, so this is some information that we will be needing to uh, to create the account. 
uh, let's go to our console again. We are still in the IAM um, dashboard. And on the left, we have access management um, panel and we go to uh, users. You can see that I already have one user added here. Um, to add new users, you, uh, you click add users button. You fill in all the necessary information, for example, and you select what kind of credentials will this user be using. They, uh, they would, um, you can choose uh, either access keys um, and or uh, passwords. So access keys would be um, suitable for uh, for accessing AWS with um, SDKs or through APIs, and password is needed to uh, to access the uh, AWS console. We can select both. Um, there are some settings about the um, the password generation, resetting password. And then we can configure the permissions that the, um, that the uh, user uh, will be having. Um, we, we can add the permissions in two ways. We can add the uh, user to the group that you see I have already added uh, earlier, or we can attach some uh, policies to the user uh, directly. The ones that we are uh, interested right now is administrator access, which will al um, allow you to, uh, to uh, have access to all the resources uh, in, the, in the account. Um, and then we need to click through this, some tags, then we can review all the information. And if we create create user, then it will be created for us. And we will be able to, uh, to download the access keys for the, uh, for the user too. But since I already have the uh, created IAM user, I want to do this. And instead, what I will do is that I will log into the uh, to developer account that I have created. So I go to, uh, to the top panel again, I click sign out. And I need to click log back in. Here I need to choose um, not root user, but I am user. And I need to specify my account ID, which is just nine. And here I need to put all the um, credentials. So developer and then my password. And if I sign in, it accepts my, uh, my credentials and you can see that I am now logged in as a developer at Stas9 account. Okay, so we have this out of the picture. So now let's talk about, um, about what we have just done. I think I am user admin and, and using it is obviously not the best thing you can do uh, permissions wise. And and you will be right. Um, giving everyone uh, admin permissions is a is a bad practice too. But for practical reasons, I think it's good to start here. And um, when your account or application grows, you will obviously, um, I hope so at least, um, use some uh, more secure uh, approach to this. What would be the more secure approaches, or uh, or good practices in 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 general? Um, you definitely don't want to share your IAM user credentials with anyone else because IAM user represents you as a, a singular user, right? Um, if anyone else wants to use your account, they should have their own um, user credentials. Um, please store your access keys in a secure location so they can be um, um, hijacked from you. For example, don't push them to public GitHub repositories. That would, uh, that would be nice not to do. Um, you can add two-stage authentication to your um, IAM user. So you can use um, MFA codes uh, for logging in. And um, you can, and you should also uh, limit users' permissions to only necessary ones. So that if you have many users, um, not everyone has uh, administrative access, but only the the um, access that they actually need to perform their day-to-day -day tasks in, in your AWS account. What would be the better practices? Those would include not using IAM users at all. 
uh, because you have the possibility to connect to a third party of the authentication provider like, uh, like Okta, for example, and they would handle um, logins and passwords. Um, this is much more scalable and you are able to assign uh, short-lived uh, credentials to, uh, to such um, uh, third party users based on IAM roles. Uh, to those who were able to uh, to authenticate. So even though they are getting some uh, some uh, short-lived uh, access keys to access console and the uh, and the SDK, uh, even even if the access keys are um, are hijacked, uh, they will um, like um, they will be um, valid only uh, for some short amount of time. So. The risk of um, of abusing the system is much much uh, much much less. All right. So now that we have our IAM user, we have our account uh, more or less secure. Um, we can uh, try to use Boto three um, Python SDK to write a Python application that would access uh, AWS. Um, Boto three actually uses AWS CLI uh, for uh, for authentication against uh, AWS, so we need to use it. Uh, 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 there is this command inside the CLI uh, named AWS configure, so we will use it right now. Mm. All right, so first thing that we will need is our uh, security credentials. So we go to, uh, to the top bar, we click security credentials again, we go to um, access keys. You can see that I already have an access key. You can see its ID here. You won't be able to, uh, to read the secret anywhere because it's only on my computer. Um, to create a new access key, you click this button. And you can see that uh, it is now available. Uh, if you want to use it, you can download a CSV file uh, containing the ID and the secret, or you can read the secret here. I won't do this because I don't need this, this access key. And to what we do with, with those credentials is that we type AWS in our terminal, and we are provided with a prompt to enter our um, access key ID. Enter, and our and our secret uh, secret access key. We paste uh, uh, those both um, credentials here. We click Enter, and then there are some additional prompts that we are um, that are made to us. So AWS CLI is asking about the default region name. Region being a um, set of data centers uh, located in in some specific location. Uh, EU central one means that this is a um, um, like um, bunch of data centers located in in Frankfurt, Germany. So this is what I will use for uh, for um, uh, because they're close to me. And we can also uh, configure default output format for. Um, but we don't need this. This is um, this is uh, rather for executing AWS CLI commands and configuring uh, how the output would, uh, will look, whether JSON, YAML, whatever. We don't need that. All right, so we have our AWS um, um, configured for um, programmatic access uh, against uh, AWS. So. Now what we can do is we can do some hands-on. Let us go to, to the terminal again. What I'm going to do actually is that I'm going to make this smaller to have everything on one, uh, on one screen. And we have some code that we can use to, um, to do stuff. Here's the, um, vir the virtual environment in Python that I have already created uh, with my Boto 3 um, installed. So you can see this is Python 3. I do import the three. And then I need to create 
a resource for accessing DynamoDB uh, service. DynamoDB. And you do this by typing go to three dot resource and the name of the of the uh, service. It created the uh, the resource for us, and now we can uh, try to list all the tables we have in the, in the account. We can see that we have some two tables, uh, one of which is the one that we have created. And the second one is that I have created in the past with some other tools. We can um, refer to this one specific table that is of interest for us. And we can, for example, see how many items are inside. We have two items in the table. And we can see uh, what are those items by typing to do scan. And we are returned with the um, with the uh, data about the items. So you uh, you can see that there are uh, two items here. First of which is with ID three. Um, there are some data. Um, yeah. So so that's how you would use. Um, um, both of three um, in Python. And we can, uh, of course, uh, write applications with it, right? I have some, uh, some code already prepared for, uh, for, uh, for accessing our table. So here you can see how the example program looks like. We have the um, bigger. All right, so what you have here is that we do imports and then we, um, we retrieve our um, uh, resources that we will use. And we have the get item function that um, expects an item key being an integer. And we do to do get item um, call to our uh, DynamoDB table, uh, specifying the, uh, the key ID with the, um, with the item key that was specified to the function. And then we try to, re uh, to return the item provided by, uh, by uh, the SDK. And if it's not found, we uh, raise an exception. We have some, uh, some uh, bo boilerplate to, uh, to convert this to JSON and we dump the, uh, the JSON to the standard output. So let's try this out now. We go here and we do Python get um, item ID two, for example. And you can see ID two, value by milk, complete true, right? And, we, and if we do three, we will get another item. And if we, if we try to um, retrieve item with ID 10, we will see that there is an exception raised from the program. We have also another small program to put items to the database which is very similar in structure, but it is using the put item call to the, uh, to the, to the table to actually put some, uh, some um, new data. You can use this call to either put new items or, uh, or update the existing ones. So how would you use it is the Python dot dot pi. Let's add the item then. Um, here we type. Uh, here, this it's the value for uh, for um, uh, for uh, whether the item is complete. So yes, it's getting converted to um, to boolean by a very um, convenient function named Esther to bool. If you don't know it, then you know now. And then we have the description uh, description of the to do item. Um, like by potatoes and it will add the item to us and now if we do python dot python it will return the item all right so this is very nice very cool and so on but um this is not in cloud right uh i mean our uh, our application so what can we do to actually execute this code in the cloud. And um, 
I'm sorry to uh, to stop here, but that's all I have for uh, for part one. <laughs> so um, we will uh, use Lambda in the next part to uh, to take the code we wrote to put it in in Lambda function and have the code actually being uh, being executed in the in the AWS without um, you know worrying about uh, provisioning servers and so on and so on. We will also put um, API on top of ev uh, of everything, so um, so our application can uh, can uh, can work as a REST service, and we will put this all together uh, uh, together into a working uh, application, and maybe even more during the part two. All right, so that's all that I had uh, for today. Do you have any? Any uh, any questions or any feedback that you would like to uh, to give to me? Yeah, I have uh, actually one question. Hello. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, did you maybe consider to also take into consideration like this latest uh, feature provided by AWS regarding Lambda that we are actually omitting uh, AWS API gateway and we are directly calling. Uh, um, API from Lambdas itself. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure the name of this feature. It's called uh, URL Lambda or something like this. Did you have a chance to look at uh, this one for for the Lambdas? Um, unfortunately, no. And um, I mean, uh, I have considered many alternatives for uh, for deploying uh, Python applications in a AWS and. And this was kind of a considered choice to, to also use uh, use API Gateway, okay, because it's 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 a very nice component that you uh, that you can use to uh, to separate your uh, API from whatever implementation you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully understand that. Uh, of course, it, from from the, from the perspective of uh, you know the project needs, uh, it it is convenient to have. Mm -hmm. A separate layer as uh, API gateway, but still, if we are talking about, you know, for instance, uh, preparing some sort of uh, POCs or something like that, I guess this um, new approach with uh, direct calling, uh, uh, with direct uh, Lambda calling instead of, you know, mm -hmm. setting up uh, API gateway, which obviously will also um, produce some costs in the end mm -hmm. that might be a really helpful thing to um to really to to also dive in but yeah okay so that 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 would be actually it okay thanks for us yeah i have uh, some kind of question mm -hmm. also uh, it would be interesting to look uh, on uh, how to host container apps uh, in a serverless way, and mm -hmm. in which cases it's more preferable to use the lambdas, and in which cases it's more preferable to use containers. Like, what are the use cases for both of those solutions? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, if I have uh, enough time for the next session, I will try to talk about it. Thank you for your suggestion. And uh, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. If we are talking about next topics, also for me it would be interesting um, about different tools which allow us to deploy uh, our functions to Lambda, actually, especially without using of uh, third party libraries for code. What do you mean? Um, what kind of third-party um, uh, libraries? The annual for request, for example. Um, all right, sure. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> thank you. And also, thank you for this lecture. It was, it was interesting. All right. I'm happy to hear it. I was a little uh, nervous during it, so... <laughs> Glad you liked it. <laughs>